Okay, so over the past five weeks, we've been practicing the four protective meditations. And so I just want to close with some words to wrap up what we've been doing, and then to explain how to integrate these practices into your regular meditation practice. Okay, so these four meditation subjects are included amongst the many topics of meditation that were taught by the Buddha. But in the Theravada tradition, the four have been sort of selected out and then put into this group called protective meditations. Chatur Araka in Pali. And they're called this because each of them performs a particular, what I call a protective function in our spiritual development. And the list, traditionally, it begins with Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha, because the set of four has been taught to those who are traditionally Buddhist. And so one begins with strengthening one's confidence or trust in the Buddha as the spiritual teacher, as the unsurpassed spiritual teacher. And this becomes extremely important because you could say that it protects one as one is cultivating the path because there come times of, say, periods, sometimes of doubt, dejection, if one is not making the progress that one expected, uncertainty, wavering, temptations to give up the practice and then to revert just to lead a very ordinary worldly life. And so it's one's trust and confidence in the Buddha that continually spurs one to continue along this path of practice. And for those who have what's called a faith temperament or a devotional temperament, the recollection of the Buddha can become a very powerful and effective means of towards, leading towards samadhi. And this is because one of the factors that leads most directly to samadhi is joy. And so if one is doing something like <laughs> mindfulness of breathing, you know, just attending, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, it has its, certainly, it definitely has its benefits, but sometimes the mind can become a bit dry and rigid. But when one takes the recollection of the Buddha and turns the qualities of the Buddha over in one's mind, then it brings up this upswelling, this swelling up of joy in the mind. And joy leads to happiness, to a sense of contentment, to even to bliss. And on the basis of that joy and bliss, it becomes much easier to slide into samadhi. And the samadhi can be developed with the Buddha himself as the object of meditation. It's said that the recollection of the Buddha itself does not lead to jhana, to full absorption. But let's not quibble and, <laughs> and think it's either full absorption or else, either full absorption or bust. But recollection of the Buddha can lead to the state approaching jhana, the state that's called upachara samadhi, access concentration. And so if one can develop access concentration based on the Buddha, then it becomes much easier to transfer over to one of the meditation subjects that will lead directly to, to full absorption to jhana. Whereas if one is trudging along with great difficulty, you know, with mindfulness of breathing or attention to the sensations, then it can become more difficult to gain concentration. Okay, so the second protective meditation is loving kindness. And loving kindness is a protective meditation because it's considered the direct antidote towards ill will, hatred, and resentment. 
So these uh, ill will, resentment, that is a very powerful hindrance which blocks progress in meditation. And not only does it block progress in meditation, but when ill will, anger, and hatred <coughs> take possession of the mind, then one can engage in many types of unwholesome actions, speaking harshly to others, competing aggressively with others, denigrating others, even engaging in physical violence. And all of that, not only does it harm one's meditation, but it sort of burns up and destroys a lot of one's accumulations of merit, and it creates powerful, unwholesome karma that will create an obstruction to one's progress. And so in this way, by developing loving kindness, then one develops an openness of heart, an ability to empathize with others, and so it blocks the entryway of anger and ill will into the mind, and it creates this wonderful feeling of unity with others and empathy with others, and it also opens the gateway to compassion and altruistic joy to of the other immeasurable qualities of mind. And loving kindness, like recollection of the Buddha, also brings up joy and happiness into the mind, and thereby it makes it much easier to gain samadhi. So the Buddha mentions as one of the benefits of loving kindness meditation that chittang sukkang samadhi, the mind becomes concentrated easily. So this is one of the benefits of loving-kindness meditation and the way it protects our practice. Okay, the third protective meditation is the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body. And as I said, this meditation was originally prescribed by the Buddha for those who have just newly entered upon the monastic life. Because one of the big obstacles when one goes forth into the monastic life is sexual desire. You know, just because you shave the head and put on robes, it doesn't mean that sexual desire goes away. And so what the Buddha taught, especially for novices, is this meditation on the 32 parts of the body, which helps to it, gradually to weaken the pull of sensual desire. And sensual desire is also one of the five hindrances, one of the obstacles to concentration. And so by developing, even occasionally, the meditation on the parts of the body, it will put a damper on sensual desire. It will incline the mind in the direction of renunciation, detachment from sensual desire, and this will facilitate the path to deeper concentration and then to samadhi. Then the meditation on death, the recollection or the mindfulness of death, serves as a counter. It protects us from falling into what is called heedlessness or negligence, you know, from leading a life of just worldly enjoyments, just falling into worldly complacency, being satisfied with the day-to-day -day routine of our, of our daily lives. But when we do the recollection of death, then we re we're reminded that death can take place at any time. And this serves as a spur that keeps us engaged in the practice. So in this way, these four function as protections of the mind in our process of cultivation. So how does one integrate these practices into one's regular meditation practice? I recommend always as using as one's primary meditation practice what we might call a non-conceptual technique, something like mindfulness of breathing, even though one uses some conceptualization, but it's what I would call a colorless or a colorless meditation subject. 
And that helps to bring to one's attention, to remind one, to enable one to see how one's mind is functioning. And thereby it helps in understanding oneself and in shaping the mind. So, as I, one sh I recommend, one continue to use a non-conceptual object, mindfulness of breathing, observing rise and fall of the abdomen, attention to the bodily sensations as the primary object. But you can include in your period of meditation practice, from time to time, one of these four protective meditations. Maybe include a 10-minute period which you devote to one of the four protective meditations, whichever one you prefer, or whichever one you see the need for. If you're tending to get angry frequently or to be bearing ill will, then loving kindness. If you want to put a damp to dampen the force of sensual desire, do the parts of the body. If one is getting lazy and negligent, a recollection of death. And if one wants to arouse the joy of faith and devotion, mindfulness of the Buddha. And so you can add this, you know, as a 10 minute period into your regular meditation practice, or alternatively, from time to time, say for a period of a week, you could put aside your regular meditation object and just take up one of these four protective meditations and use that as your primary object for the period of the week. Then at the end of the week, put it down and take up the original object and maybe include that protective meditation in a 10 minute period in your day to day practice. Our time is running short and I wanted to leave at least, you know, five minutes for questions. So, does anybody have any questions? Please, oh, yeah, and take the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bhante. Uh, I have a quick question about the, uh, regarding the first one. I understand the concentration leads to entering the jhana. Uh, I understand the mindfulness and stuff, but. Um, I don't quite understand the neglection of the Buddha. It leads to the jhana state, because usually the concentration is a one pointless. Yeah. So you're not supposed to have a lot of a functioning about the uh, thinking process yeah, that requires, yeah. but the neglection, the collection of a Buddha is requires you a lot of imagination and thinking process. Yeah. How can it lead to the jhana? Yeah. As I said, the recollection of the Buddha itself is not a meditation subject that brings the jhana. It's not the object of jhana. But I said that it can lead to the jhana in the sense that it can lead to the access concentration, which is a degree of concentration which is approaching the jhana. And what one does in recollection of the Buddha, one begins by recalling, calling to mind the nine qualities of the Buddha. But as one progresses and gets familiar with them, one starts to reduce the number of qualities one is focusing on until, as I presented it this morning, one knocks off six and remains with three. And then once one gets deeper focus on those three, then one drops two and just selects one and bears that one in mind. And also one is mentally visualizing the Buddha. And so the combination of visualization with the, recall, with the focus on the single quality brings a degree of concentration which is, lead, which is tending to, to jhana. Somebody else? Yes, Michael? Um, on a simpler note, perhaps, I notice that when we, uh, when we talk about 
uh, loving kindness, and we go through the loving kindness um, formula, if you will. Uh, we never use the word we. We always say you or yeah. the person. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering what the significance of that is, if there is any significance. Can we include ourselves, for example, by saying, may we be happy? Well, we include ourselves when we begin with ourself, but then one wants to proceed from oneself to other people. Well, I'm thinking of groups. Um, well, actually, I think you weren't here when we... I was not. When we did that. Okay. When one is doing what is called the expansion of loving-kindness, then one will start, one does what is called the, the geographical expansion. And so in that, one begins with all the, say, all the people in this room may... No, I'm not using the word we or us, but may everyone in this room be well and happy and so forth. Then may everybody in this monastery be well and happy. So that includes uh, each of us along with everybody else. Oh. Until we get may everybody in the world, that includes, uh, you know, each of us in individually, we're in the world. So may all human beings be well and happy. I'm a human being. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bunty. Okay, we have time for one more question, and you have it. Bhante, um, I'm curious about the word abandon. Um, so it's to abandon uh, loved ones. It's not, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think maybe the English word abandon has some negative yeah. connotations, once it, because maybe it conjures up the picture of maybe a woman who doesn't want to take care of a newborn baby, you know, she has it out of wedlock maybe, and so she takes it and puts it on the roadside and goes off and abandons the child. But the, this is not the idea that's being suggested. It's not that one is deliberately, you know, casting off others and not being concerned about them. It's just that when we, when we pass away, then we have to leave behind everyone. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, we do have to um, wrap things up because at four o'clock the nuns will come in to do the evening service and we have to tidy everything up. So let's end with the sharing of the merits. And so through all of the merits that we've accumulated through our practice today and over the past five weeks, we share this merit with the devas, the Buddhas and with all sentient beings. Akasa ta chabuma ta teva naga mehitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta teva naga mehitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu desanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta Teva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang eta vatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe devanumodantu sabe bhutanumodantu sabe satanumodantu sabha sampati siddhya pavagupadaya avici hetato E tantare satakayupapanna rupia rupicha asanya sanino tu kapamu chantu pusantu nibuting. Okay, and then we end with three half bows to the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs>